Hello, and welcome to our episode about the Mongols and Yuan China. The Mongols have an interesting divide of opinion amongst historians. Most people put them into one of two categories: barbarians or the ultimate trade facilitators. We will see what you think about the Mongols by the end of this lecture. The Mongols originate in an area north of China called the Mongolian Steppes. As you can see from the image on the screen, it's a very beautiful area, but it doesn't offer much in the way of fertile farmland to grow crops on. The Mongol people historically have been a pastoral nomadic society that travels in smaller groups. They have had many skirmishes with the Chinese throughout their history, but have never been able to siege large-scale power until this point in history. Mongolian housing looks like the images displayed in the picture. Since they have lived in what is often a harsh climate, they needed more insulated dwellings, like the yurts you see here. They would usually transport these yurts on wagons instead of folding up the wrappings and remaking the yurt every evening. They called these wagons gurs. No, I'm not kidding. That's really what they called them. While the Mongols did live in separate clans, there was an accepted capital city. This city was called Karakoram and was located next to a major river that runs through Mongolia. As you can see from the map to the right, most clans would leave their yurts outside the city walls, and commerce and gathering was the only thing that happened in the city center. Most people did not live in the capital long term, so it was always a sea of changing faces. The unification of the Mongols will happen because of a man named Timujin, or you might know him better as Genghis Khan. Timujin was the son of a local Mongol leader, and when he was young, he watched as his father was poisoned by a neighboring tribe. He swore that day that he would take revenge, and he did. He killed that entire tribe by the time he was twenty-five. It is after this that he would gain respect as a ruler and unite the Mongols over a common goal. Mongolian expansion. He then gives himself a new name, Genghis Khan, or Universal Ruler. During his rule, Genghis Khan will build the world's largest land-based empire, and he will establish the capital of his empire in Karakorum, the traditional Mongolian capital. Today, around one third of the population, the world population, is related to Genghis Khan due to the high number of women he raped and slept with during his life. So as you can imagine, he has a controversial image among historians. As you can see from the map, Genghis Khan conquered all the way from China in the east to Persia in the west. Before his death, Genghis Khan divided his empire into four parts, one area for each of his legitimate sons. The division is shown on the map. Each khanate, or like basically small country, had its own ruler and its own set of laws and rules. One of the most important things for the Mongols will be the use of horses, and I have this quote here that I like to use to talk about that role. So this is from Elizabeth Kendall, who traveled through Mongolia in 1911, and she observed, "To appreciate the Mongol, you must see him on horseback, and indeed, you rarely see him otherwise, for he does not put foot to ground if he can help it. The Mongol without his pony is only half a Mongol." But with his pony, he is as good as two men. It is a fine sight to see him tearing over the plain, loose bridle, easy seat, much like the Western cowboy, but with less sprawl. This is one of the biggest reasons that the Mongols were so successful in their expansion. They didn't need fancy equipment; they just were highly skilled at what they did. And if you notice, this quote is from 1911, so you can still see what an important part of their culture horses still have today. Mongol warriors were always on horseback. They could travel at fast paces and were even able to sleep while on horseback. They would start their training around the age of six and then never left their horses. The Mongols were most well known for their unique style of warfare. They moved quickly from place to place and were some of the first people to utilize the stirrup, so they were able to ride standing up, which gave them better angles to shoot from. They usually did not carry any supplies with them, so it was easier for them to travel. They preferred instead to just pillage anything they needed from local villages as they traveled along. The Mongols had incredible bow and arrow skills, and since they had horseman skills from an early age, they were able to be very accurate with the bow and arrow, even from far away. They also had unique military tactics. They would often try to attack a city starting in a straight line. 
so that their enemy could not tell how many of them there were. Then they would fan out and encircle the city and start fighting their way to the center. They were also known for faking a retreat and coming back around to the weak side of a battle to take out more opponents. They also liked to use psychological warfare. For example, in Mongol camps, Genghis Khan would make each man build five fires so that their opponents never knew how many of them there actually were, and it seemed like this great force was about to overtake you. Towns would hear of the Mongols' arrival and immediately surrender. If your town didn't surrender, the Mongols would make a point of killing any member of the town taller than the axle on a wheel. So basically, nothing larger than a baby. With all that being said, life under the Mongols was not as brutal as you might think. They basically let you keep doing what you were doing before. Things like religion and cultural customs were not changed. The only thing they really did want you to do was pay their taxes and follow their rules. They had some pretty strict punishments for rule breakers. For example, Genghis Khan's tax, law, tax laws read, if you do not pay homage, or basically pay your taxes, we will take your prosperity. If you do not have prosperity, we will take your children. If you do not have children, we will take your wife. And if you do not have a wife, we will take your head. As you can see, they use cruelty as a weapon. Some areas will never recover from Mongol destruction. So up to now in the lecture, we have mostly focused on the Mongols' barbaric reputation, but they're also known for a few good things. One of the most surprising things about the Mongols is that they will be huge patrons of the arts. Think about it. If you live in a pastoral society, you probably don't have a lot of art because that is one more thing to carry with you and you're not very materialistic. But the arts are something they will value, basically because they've always seen it as something they never had but wanted. They will offer artisans special privileges in the places they conquer. Like for example, if the Mongols were invading and killing everyone in your village, they would often spare artisans because they saw them as valuable. They also did, re did not require artisans to pay corvée taxes. If you remember from previous episodes, corvée taxes are labor required labor hours citizens would sometimes have to do. It is under Genghis Khan that the Mongols declare the Pax Mongolica, or Time of Mongol Peace and Prosperity. It is under the Mongols that the Silk Road will hit its peak. You can see from the red lines here on the map all of the trade routes that flourished under the Mongols. While the Mongols didn't really accumulate many material goods, they did like to collect money. So they set up tax points for merchants on the Silk Road and heavily policed it. People were so afraid of the Mongols' reputation that there was almost no crime at all along the Silk Road. One outsider who gives us a great perspective of the Mongols is Marco Polo. Marco Polo was a Venetian merchant who traveled along the Silk Road and eventually made it into Mongol-occupied China. It is there that he becomes noticed by Genghis Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan the leader of the newly created Yuan dynasty. Marco Polo was instituted as an advisor to Kublai Khan, and he kept well-documented accounts of his time with the Mongols. He wrote about some of the strange things going on in China, like black stones that you could light on fire, gunpowder and fireworks, and of course, what I think is one of China's best inventions, the noodle. Side note, I think it's very interesting that basically every food we think about that is Italian didn't actually originate in Italy. Noodles came from China. The tomato is a new world food, so they wouldn't be able to make any tomato-based sauce until after 1500. So really, Italy is totally unoriginal in their food and shouldn't get as much credit for the deliciousness of spaghetti or lasagna as they do. Anyways. Here is a map of Marco Polo's travels. As you can see, he is probably the most well-traveled European during this time period. When he gets back to Europe, his accounts are made into a book called The Travels of Marco Polo, and it becomes a medieval bestseller. Let's go back to the Yuan Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty will be around from 1279 to 1368 CE. Kublai Khan will be the ruler of the dynasty during the end period of the Pax Mongolica. He will tolerate Chinese culture, but will prefer to keep what is Mongolian separate from what is Chinese. In other words, he doesn't want the two cultures to blend. He distrusted the Chinese people. 
I mean, it makes sense with him being an outsider ruling over the proud and majestic Chinese. So because of his mistrust, he did not allow any Chinese people to be in top government posts, preferring instead to have Mongolian people or complete outsiders like Marco Polo in charge. This was a huge slap in the face to the Chinese, who, as you may remember, had a real ego complex about being the best and most advanced people. Kublai Khan will encourage foreign trade and is part of the reason the Silk Road was thriving. He's also part of the reason the plague was able to spread so quickly to Europe, because he increased long-distance trade. Kublai Khan's greatest defeats came from his attempts to take over Japan. He tried two different times to send fleets over to Japan to take over the island, but both times he was stopped by typhoons that blew through while his troops were traveling. Fun fact, the Japanese refer to typhoon winds as kamikaze, or winds of the gods. I think when we hear the word kamikaze, we immediately think of the pilots from World War II. But it makes sense that they were called kamikaze pilots because they were flying on the winds of the gods, literally in the air. So Kublai Khan does experience some other defeats in Southeast Asia later in his life, but that is not what will end the Mongol Empire. The Mongols are great at conquering, but not at the general administration it takes to run an empire. Each khanate was trying to make their own rules and blend existing cultures together. Overall, that didn't work out well for them. The Mongols had never had to run a country before and deal with the daily tasks of making sure you have an effective government system. In under 150 years, all of the Mongols' holdings will be lost. This concludes our one-part series about the Mongols in the Yuan dynasty. Thanks for watching.